I mean that I'm hoping that my grandma probably will hear that she's sorry for me because I was sorry. She said she's sorry. So my um my uncle lives next door to my parents and it's not somebody who's my uncle who lives next door to us in Hong Kong Springs, we got a Trump 2020 and hung it see it from our house. <laughs> my dad was like, Hello, how are you? Hello. This mix up is a couple books for me because even the people are not my property. I don't come out of the one. Have you seen this thing? Yeah. <laughs> 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 This is a microphone like this. You heard it then, but not now. You heard it now. I can show you right there. Oh, yeah, you could sell. Wow, we think. You didn't seem to agree. I love all Americans. Everyone, we can see you too. Yep. How you doing? Oh, I thought you were talking to me. I was like, this is how I talk literally every day in my life. I was like, see myself. Madison, did anybody ask you to this guy yet what the midterm is on? No. 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 But we can't. Maybe just chapter. Oh, I'm going to ask 100% if no one else does. One and a half. Yeah. I don't know. Also, oh, I've been saying so much of why I was like, we can have our computers. I'm dead. Professor, are we going to go over um, what to expect in the midterm today? Okay. We can do that. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think a lot of us, are actually, I'm just speaking to myself. We yeah. have a little bit of like, I'm not sure. Gosh, right. I had one thing in the syllabus. The syllabus. I know. Then I, then I had to send, yeah, then I had to send an email saying, don't pay attention to the syllabus. Can you can even do that. This <laughs> is like, like a contract with a final team. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so I can understand it. Yeah, but the most important thing is the graded papers for the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Six? Six thirty? Yeah, there's the guy still sitting there. You can find him. Is it six? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to mention that first. Of all. Yeah. 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 And then I would show up in class, and it's never actually happened. But it could. But it, could. it could happen anyway. <laughs> so that's why I did that. Yeah. Yeah. Pumpkin spice everything, like that thing. Oh no no no! I, when I looked at it, I was like, no, but I was about I was about to tell you no. And then you said yeah, because I did the same thing. When I read, I was like, I like, came up and I was like, so. And then I think Brendan's like, I literally was like, and then I read that and I was like, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's is that is what was the how did your child turn out? Oh, well, I'm about to cover that. Okay, I want to know. Yeah, good would not be the adjective I would pick. Well, he's already dead. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you for asking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No. Can't win them all. No. Until now, I had, but. That was a tough can't. situation, right? It yeah, really yeah. was. Yeah. 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 Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I've missed y'all. Who knows? Maybe you missed me. Probably not. But honestly, I did miss y'all. Uh, today, we'll be playing with the technology again throughout the lecture. If you'd like to play along, I welcome you to do that. As you might remember from the last time we played with the technology, if you want to buzz in and be a part of the live polls that we'll have up on the big board, all you need to do is pick the electronic device of your choice. Maybe you'll pick one of these phones. Maybe you'll pick a laptop. Maybe you'll pick a Kindle. Maybe you'll pick a... Blackberry? No, I'm just making stuff up. Whatever you might pick, you want to visit this website here. And if I haven't pointed out before, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out again that the P. McGinley 553 was randomly assigned to me. I didn't pick that. So if 553 has some meaning nowadays that I'm unaware of, it's it has nothing to do with me. Yeah, somebody else, aha, I knew he was a member of the 553s. I really don't know what that is. So randomly is. P. McGinley 553. The P obviously stands for my first name and McGinley my last, but the 553, I don't know what that is. So there it is. But welcome back. Missed y'all. Been distracted. Had to put on my trial. And as I'm sure you've noticed by now, humility is not really my thing. Maybe you've noticed that. I've never hesitated to point out that I've been litigating, defending my fellow lawyers for 23 years now. Never once have I lost and well, last time you heard me say that will have been the last time that I could say that because finally, yeah, took took my licking, got defeated. My client, my client was found guilty. So, and, and it's frustrating because I'd already won this trial, and it was up to the Florida Supreme Court, and they sent it back because there was a typo, yeah, invited error, I believe, because the bar told the referee back in May 2018 uh, these should not be findings of fact if you want to send my client to a diversion, a pretrial diversion, which ironically you can do post-trial here in Florida. But it's not discipline, so we were happy to get it. It's not a conviction, so we were happy to go to the continuing legal education class that would have consisted of the pre-trial diversion. But the Florida Supreme Court said you have to have findings of fact before you can send someone to diversion. Wouldn't have been a problem if the same judge had been there, I'm sure, but here we are with a new judge. She decided that my client was guilty as charged. So, so then the trial lasted longer than I had anticipated because stage two is the sentencing hearing, which I was very thankful I have no experience in whatsoever until finally had to go to this sanctions hearing. And I was so impressed with my client. I, I, I realized yet again how blessed I am to represent a good man like him because he had no fewer than 19, 19 witnesses on the stand and the things they were testifying about him in mitigation were just they were beautiful they were they were heart touching there there was a, a young man on the stand said he had adhd said he had met my client and, and felt he could go nowhere in life and my client convinced him that his alleged disability was an ability and because of that this young man went to law school because of that he's a lawyer today he was moved by that testimony another gentleman took the stand and, and an immigrant from his my client's community talked about how he was so scared so many years ago when his business was failing, but he was afraid to look to the bankruptcy courts because his immigration status was questionable. And my client, free of charge, fixed his immigration status, got him through the bankruptcy, gave him additional business advice. He now owns five restaurants, employs 60 people, and credits it all to my client. I mean, the testimony was moving, and it was certainly mitigating. Oh, something for me. Okay. She couldn't print them. Yeah, she would know how to print the or something. So okay. she said maybe just a new guy was Thank you there. for alerting me. Like all right. Wrong. No, no, you, this is important. Thank you, and I'll get back to you in just a minute. But with all that positive testimony, I felt so good to put my client on the stand until he decides to put his feet up on the witness stand. Mm -hmm. And to complain and bemoan and to yell and to belittle. And the, as I interrupted him, he told me to be quiet. Finally, the judge showed some mercy and interrupted him. And he told the judge to be quiet. And then finally, at the end of his testimony, he is standing up. He is pointing at her honor. 
and he is yelling at her. And I paraphrase, but what I heard was something along the lines of, and if this is what you want from a member of the Florida Bar, then you can tear up my bar card. Oh. Which I distinctly recall <laughs> not being part of the free witness prep. <laughs> And he said to me later, you know, that isn't exactly the testimony we talked about. And I said, you're right, it's not. <laughs> I called an audible. He said he's a, he's a football fan. The quarterback on the football field might disagree with the coach and, and call a new play uh, in the heat of the moment. I called an audible, he said. And I did it my way. And I said, yeah, yeah, you did it your way. <laughs> so I, I did not win. Did not win. And I was tempted for a moment to feel unappreciated. Of course, I'm being paid, so I shouldn't feel <laughs> But I was tempted for a moment to feel unappreciated. And you know, you are law students, you are lawyers. You will find yourself in that situation. You will feel unappreciated by your clients. You will be serving people. You will make sacrifices for, you will cancel lectures and get coverage for so you can help them. You will spend overtime, sacrifice time from your family, from your friends, from your children in order to help them. And in the end, you may just feel unappreciated. If you practice law long enough, it's going to happen to you. If you talk to any lawyer who's practiced long enough, it has happened to them. And it can happen from all kinds of clients, whether it's defending your fellow lawyers like I do. Or maybe it's defending the widows and children. Maybe it's defending the corporations and entities. No matter what clients you might have, you're going to sometimes feel unappreciated. Our great profession is one in which we literally take the burdens of our clients and we put them on our own backs. We do it. And sometimes we don't appreciate, we don't feel appreciated by our clients. It's going to happen to you. And it'll happen to you in the most unlikely of places. I dare say when you do pro bono work, you will sometimes feel unappreciated. I have noticed and other lawyers have noticed that sometimes the pro bono client can be the most demanding. They need your help. They need it right now. They need to interrupt you right now. They need you to help them right now. That happens sometimes. So the question becomes in this great profession of ours, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that feeling of being unappreciated? because it's going to happen. And if there's any advice I could give, maybe I'm not the perfect person to give advice on this because I'm so well paid by my clients. <laughs> but if there's any good advice that I might have for you, of course, is to have a strong basis in your faith, in your faith, whatever faith you might have. I wear my faith upon my sleeve. You've heard me mention it before. I'm a member of the Catholic Church because Catholicism gives me so much. And one of the things that Catholicism reminds me of is that it's not about them and it's not about me. It's not. When we help others, when we take the burdens of others and put them on our backs, whether it's temporarily because they're paying us so well or whether it's pro bono because the community and they need the help, when we put their burdens upon our backs, it's not about them and it's not about you. The Lord, your God, your savior said, whatsoever you do for the least of your brothers, that you've done for me. And that really is the answer in my opinion to those rare times or even those frequent times where you might feel unappreciated, whether it's because you're a lawyer helping a client who seems unappreciated, whether you're down and helping food pantry or you're helping at the charity or you're seeing someone in the street and they seem to be panhandling and you hand them a few dollars and you wonder to yourself, is that really going to a meal and some food or is it going to some ulterior purpose? When you help someone out and they just keep asking for more help and there seems to be some sort of dependency growing, you can't sometimes but help to ask yourself, Am I unappreciated? Am I doing the right thing? And you know what? Sometimes you're going to give a dollar or five or ten to a panhandler who has literally ripped you off. Sometimes you're going to be down 
at the homeless shelter or the food pantry and you're going to be donating and the food's going to go to waste and it's going to get thrown out or the people who got that food could have bought it for themselves there will be those times as a lawyer where you did some pro bono work for somebody who really could have opened their wallet and paid for it who paid you to do some work and you took it way too personally and you worked too hard and in the end they were willing to just stand up out of frustration and say rip them a license <laughs> there will be times where your client doesn't appreciate you but it was never about them and it was never about you whatsoever you do for the least of his brothers you've done for him so you haven't wasted your time. You haven't been unappreciated. Want to be appreciated? Let's be appreciated in the next world instead of this one, shall we? Let's get our rewards there, not here. But if my client happens to be listening, he still does need to pay the bill. I just want to be clear about that. So with that said, let me say a prayer. Let me say a prayer for those clients that don't appreciate us. Let me say a prayer for you as you go forth to become the lawyers who are going to serve those clients. Let me say a prayer for you as the midterm exams okay. are about to come forward. I hear some grumbling and I got my post going to cover, going to cover some grading issues in just a minute. But before I do, thank you. So blessed to be in a place where I can start a class with a prayer. So let me, let me do that with your indulgence. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Michael, St. Raphael, all the archangels be with these students as they take the test as they pass the test, as they become the lawyers they want to be. And I ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Got an attendance sheet here. If you're here, you should sign in. If you're not here, you should also sign in. Someday someone's going to laugh at that joke. No, thank you. All right, and I got a very important post-it. Uh, there has been all kinds of changes to my syllabus, not made by me. <laughs> and one of the changes is, is that the graded essay assignment that is due today has to be printed and hand-delivered to the faculty office. It can't be emailed. I sent you an email saying it could be emailed. And then I got an email back from the faculty assistant saying that they couldn't receive emails. So it's got to be printed. Um, the post it says Hannah Jacobson, Jorge Garcia. Garcia, Miss Jacobson, where are you? There you are. Okay. Do, do they have a physical copy? Yeah, yeah, okay, Mr. Garcia, do they have a physical copy? Okay. I'm s obviously missing any word out of my mouth. It's a true tragedy. But I would urge you to get up and go <laughs> fix that now. Yeah, I'm getting some. So yeah. You, to, you know, type in, print me, go through the whole process. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I was out to save a tree, but no tree shall be spared in this particular assignment, apparently. Yeah. Who else has not physically printed the assignment and hand delivered it to the faculty assistants? Who else has not done that? Now's the time. Who else has, who has not even started the assignment yet? <laughs> now is certainly past the time, certainly the time. Okay. And also, you've heard the changes, the updates when it comes to the midterm. My wife Bernadette and I have gotten some child care and I've moved some things off the litigation schedule so that I can be here on Monday at six o'clock, which I did not anticipate doing, but I will be here. I have to be here. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm going to administer the midterm. I've been voluntold, volunteered, told, whatever that is. Is it not Monday? No, no, no. We're talking about class on Thursday. No, no, the midterm is yeah, Monday, yeah. as in four days from now. Yeah, yeah you're holding up the midterm. From, May I borrow uh, that? Yeah, yeah. This this clearly says McGinley, 6 p.m., Monday, October 7th. Florida Con Law, that's his class, McGinley. It's going to be in the NLB 106, which is this very room, is it not? 
New law building room one of six. Okay, thank you. For, yeah, so that is confirmed. So be there or be square. Yeah. So the, the midterm is multiple choice, which means you've got a one in five chance of getting each question right. Well, there's five choices, A, B, C, D, E. So I should have done A, B, C, D. That, that would have been better odds. Sorry. Sorry. You got a 20% chance instead of a 25% chance. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. So and that is a graded part of your ultimate exam. Just as. How many? <laughs> Should I cover it? Yeah. Well, it sounds kind of lame to say it's a 10 question exam, doesn't it? No, it sounds great. Oh, okay. So I should be proud. Yeah, the final has a lot more questions on than that. Yeah, 10, 10 questions. 30 minutes to finish. 30? Yeah, yes. So that's three minutes of question. Most of which probably can be done in three minutes. There's at least one from Judge Haberbrook. It takes a while to read. But yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. If it came out of my mouth or if it's in our, our fine book by the brilliant and very attractive author, or if it came from one of our guest lecturers, then yeah, it's fair game. It's fair game. Of course, we'd all be remiss to not go back to the website, flaconstitution.com, and go to the tab where you can see these, these beautiful slides in PDF form, right? We'd all be remiss to not review that before the exam, right? Is that blatant enough of a hint? Yeah. Or should I just come out and say... Those slides look a lot like some of the questions on exam. Anybody missed that hint? Yes. Oh, I got the microphone. Some of those slides look a lot like the questions on exam. All right. Okay. Any questions about the graded assignment, which is due in like 10 minutes? Or about the midterm. Okay, with that said, remember, if you want to play along with the technology, you remember I'm part of the 553 gang. So you go to P. McGinley 553. So let's test out the technology to see if it's working. How is the pace of this class so far? The, right now, the pace is too fast. Okay, I'll go back for a second. It's uh, polev.com slash P. McGinley 553. How about now? No. Still. Anybody? Anybody? Oh! <laughs> really like the technology to just work. Oh, I see my last name on here, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love looking at my own last name. Yeah. But I wanted you to actually. All right, let's. Do it, do it now. <laughs> Did he just wake up? This, no, he had to check him up. Pamela, that's not the word. Panama City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about now? Give me the good news. Tell me it's working now. Tell me I fixed it. Tell me it's working, please. Yes. Not yet. All right. I know much about technology, but I know if you turn the computer off and turn it back on, everything works fine. So I'm gonna try that. All of this for this question. Yeah. <laughs> so did he say earlier just chapter 22 or the guest speakers? And he said anything that's been covered in class. Yeah. So that's out of his mouth. Yeah. He did say out of my mouth. Yeah. I'm going to ask him. I'll ask him during the break. Yeah. 
Yes. You don't need our computers for the midterm, correct? It'll be on paper. Be on paper. You so can get the bubble in A, B, C, D, E. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I didn't see it on Exemplify, did you? Him? Yeah. Yeah, I got an email. I got the email, but I couldn't download it. Oh, yeah, it downloaded, but... That's probably my issue. Like, Hope for the best. Hope for the best. Tell me it works now, please. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Could you erase pain? All right, let's pretend it did work. What answer would you have chosen? <laughs> really? I'd say a bit. See, I had it set up as, as anonymous so that you could tell me the truth. <laughs> I thought we were moving too slow. I thought it was a little good. bit slow because you haven't been here. Yeah. That's that's one of the things that slows me down. <laughs> yeah. that, that's because you had a request. So if I pick up the pace, we cool with that? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Appreciate that. How fast we talk? To you? <laughs> I'm gonna talk real fast like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I probably talked too fast already. No. All right. Okay. So where are we? We are on chapter three. And the, the structure, the format of chapter three looks a lot like chapter two insofar as it starts with a brief discussion about ethics, because you know that's my thing. And then it moves on to some nuts and bolts. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we finished chapter two. <laughs> it's on the final because we finished it. No, we didn't. Oh, no, we did a great job. Miss <laughs> Stouse was here, right? Uh, uh, let's hear from Ms. Dust. Did she not do a great job? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And she wraps it up for us, did she not? She did a great mark prep course. I like that. Yeah. There's more than one person here who would like to pass a bar exam. So that was good. I'm glad she did that. All right. Okay. She did Homestead? We did, we did Sunshine Law. She did Sunshine Law. She said that they existed. I'm going home. Yeah, she's going to and you just know that they're a thing. <laughs> Right. It was a, it was a big. You got. Okay. Well, all right. We're gonna return to whatever was missed from chapter two. I'll get with Miss Stouse. I'll find out exactly which cover which did. You will get the entire syllabus. You will get it all. But today we're at chapter three. It's by popular demand, because I'm hearing you. You want chapter three. Yeah. yeah. Chapter three is going to talk about those pleading requirements for Florida constitutional law litigation, and I'm trying to keep a promise I made to. We started this class. I have my first guest speaker, Sister Rosemary Finnegan, and I promised in front of her and I promised in front of all of you that this class was about you, that this class was about empowering you, that this class was where the rubber meets the road. This class was more than just learning how to lament about a constitutional law violation. This class was also about learning what to do about a constitutional law violation. Part of that is knowing the pleading requirements. Part of that is knowing what to file, where to file it, what it looks like, what is the burden of proof, what exactly must the litigant prove in order to do something about the constitutional law violation. On the flip side, you may find yourself defending against an allegation of a constitutional law violation. What defenses are available? What might you do to overcome the claim? This, in a nutshell, is what we're talking about in chapter three that you're you're begging me to cover, and I hear you, and I am honoring your request. <laughs> but to start, because with great power comes great responsibility. I was either the son of man or Spider-Man's uncle who said that. With great power comes great responsibility, so we'd be remiss if we didn't start with a quick look at ethics, lawyer ethics and constitutional law litigation. What ethics must we worry about? Best practices require a lawyer to consider the question of whether a client's claim of unconstitutionality is one in which a lawyer is permitted to present under the applicable canons and rules of our profession. 
we're here in a class called Florida Constitutional Law. Let's look at the rules regulating the Florida Bar, for example. Let's look at Florida Bar Rule 4-3.1, if you've got the paper copy of the book, we're on page 75. And you can see there, we're talking about an obligation to bring meritorious claims and contentions. The rules tell us that a lawyer shall not, in other words, you're subject to discipline if you do, so a lawyer shall not bring or defend a proceeding. So this is a two-way street. This is not only the plaintiff. This is an obligation of the defense lawyer also. Shall not bring or defend a proceeding or assert or controvert an issue in that proceeding. So the proceeding itself may have a basis, but there may be a claim or defense that lacks a good faith meritorious basis. So shall not bring or defend a proceeding or assert or controvert an issue therein, unless there is a basis in law and fact for doing so that is not frivolous. Is not frivolous. Why start with this rule when it comes to constitutional law litigation? Because sometimes we're arguing that a law duly enacted through the democratic process is one that the court should not enforce or perhaps should strike down as unconstitutional. We are officers of the court. We are obliged to obey the laws that have been duly enacted in our democracy. So how then can we bring a claim that essentially asks for the relief that the statute or law or government action or inaction should not burden our client. And the way we do that is with clear and strict compliance with this rule 4-3.1. If you're more a fan of the ABA model rules, here in 4-3.1 is Florida's enactment of ABA model rule 3.1. So there in the model rule and in our rule regulating the Florida bar, you see the same thing. You can't bring or defend unless it's not frivolous to do so, but listen closely to this particular carve out of an exception, which includes a good faith argument for an extension, modification, or reversal of existing law. See how that might come in handy in constitutional law litigation? You are allowed to make a good faith argument for an extension, modification, or reversal of existing law. So now, Let's add some practical bite to this. How do we go about doing that? How do we make such an argument without getting ourselves disbarred? Perhaps you don't want to stand up and yell and point to the judge and tell her to tear up your bar card. Perhaps you'd rather keep yours. So how do we do that? I would suggest the best practice would be to do that up front, to do that early, to do that clearly, and to do that as part of the initial pleadings. I have a harder time defending my fellow lawyer, although up until now I'd had much success at it. But I, I have a harder time defending my fellow lawyer who, after opposing counsel has filed a motion for sanctions, and after the presiding judge has issued an order to show cause why it shouldn't be granted, who then for the first time are arguing, well, you know, this was my good faith attempt at an extension modification or reversal of existing law. And that may be true. And that may be timely to argue with that. But I would suggest it's not best practice because the presiding judge who's considering that issue might say to her or himself, huh, sounds like a convenient time to be alleging such a thing, right? Another thing to think about, if you are arguing in court to a judge and there is adverse law, be it an adverse statute, adverse administrative code rule, adverse case law precedent, and your opposing counsel fails to cite it, but it's on all fours, but it's clearly applicable, but it is binding, but it is something the judge must consider, but your opposing counsel dropped the ball and didn't mention it. What becomes your obligation? Yeah, now you've got to be the one to mention it. Do you want to stand up there and argue opposing counsel's case for him? I hope not. So 
So how do you meet the ethical obligation while still being a zealous advocate for your client's side of the case? By citing to that adverse statute, administrative code, or case law precedent, meeting the obligation, but citing to it as an attack upon it. And Your Honor, as you know, in X versus Y, that case was clearly distinguishable because of, and it was rejected in another jurisdiction, which was wise to do so. And it is equally inapplicable. It should be rejected here, although it is fine. And I state that not only for the practical purposes of protecting our license and complying with rules such as 4-3.1 of the rules regulating the Florida Bar, but also for effective advocacy. Imagine, if you will, there's a case on all fours, X versus Y, and it just clearly shoots you down. But you don't mention it. You just argue your case, talk about this, talk about that. You ramble on and on for two hours like I often do when I'm standing in front of you. And then you sit down, and all opposing counsel does is stand up and say, Your Honor, X versus Y is on all fours, and you have to reject those arguments. Thank you. Now you look like a blasted fool, don't you not? Worse yet, you seem ineffective, do you not? It's not effective advocacy to take something that's clearly on all fours, that's clearly applicable, and to just ignore it. If you're going to craft an effective argument, part of that art of advocacy is to mention and diffuse the effect of adverse precedent, case law, administrative rules, whatever it is, that's adverse to you. Sometimes that's even true with adverse testimony, adverse facts, right? What judge wants to rule in favor of the lawyer who's hiding the ball? What judge wants to rule in favor of the lawyer who's not familiar with all the applicable case law? What judge wants to rule in favor of an argument that has blatant holes in it? Sew up the holes and do so by making a good faith argument for an extension, modification or reversal of existing law. That's what I would argue to you. Other ethical issues to remember. What if there is a constitutional violation, but that's just one of the many paths to relief for your client? Are you obliged to make it a constitutional case? Are you obliged to turn that molehill of a case, one that can be won so simply without raising a constitutional argument, are you obliged to raise the constitutional argument? Who can answer that question for you? Are you obliged? Shaking your heads no, that's right. You're not obliged. How is the division of authority between lawyer and client? Is the lawyer a tool? Like a tool is picked up like a hammer, if the hammer doesn't want to swing at a particular nail, what can the hammer do about it? It's just a tool. Is that what we are? Is that what a lawyer is? And the answer is no. The client maintains the ultimate authority to choose the objective of the litigation. But the lawyer, that's you and I, has the authority to choose the means by which that objective is achieved. Your client hates opposing counsel. Opposing counsel has a funeral, would like you to agree to an extension of time so she can send in the motion unopposed and hopefully the judge will grant it. Client's barking, no, no, we've got to win this thing. Take advantage. Must you obey the client or can you agree to the unopposed extension of time? The answer is you can agree to the unopposed extension of time. Why is that? Because the client's objective to win the litigation remains your objective, but the means by which you do that, that's within your authority as the lawyer, as the advocate. If your client's on the stand and he decides he's going to call an audible and you try to interrupt him and he literally tells you and the judge to shut up, I guess at that point, your client has taken that authority from you, at least temporarily. But in most instances, that authority can't be taken from you unless you yield it. 
And I would encourage you to be something other than a tool and not to yield it. We are professionals. We choose how we practice law. We may not choose the objectives of the litigation that we're involved in. Sometimes we're appointed to a case. Sometimes a case takes different turns. But the means by which we achieve those objectives are always within our control unless we yield it. That brings me to the Froggy versus Butts case. That's at page 77. And the technical site for that is Jones versus Barnes, 463 U.S. 745. I encountered this case years ago and involved Richard Butts. He was robbed at knife point by four men. He recognized one of the assailants, didn't know the assailant's full legal name, but everyone in the community knew that assailant as Froggy. So why do I cover this case? For the obvious reason, if you were up here and you could spend your time talking about the Froggy versus Butts case, you would too, right? <laughs> and by coincidence, it also teaches us some great ethical lessons from the Supreme Court of the United States about what a lawyer is and how a lawyer can do what a lawyer is going to do. So here in the Froggy versus Butts case, the lawyer was being urged to raise certain issues on appeal. And it's a criminal case. So we've got Sixth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, civil rights, civil liberties, freedom on the line. And the issues being urged by the client for the court appointed lawyer to raise, they're not frivolous. They're citations to the record. There's certainly authority to support that these alleged errors we find in the record might lead to reversible error. But what is the court appointed lawyer doing? The court appointed lawyer is picking and choosing from those arguments, not even raising some of those arguments. Keep in mind, he's not rejecting them because they're frivolous. He's not rejecting them because there isn't citations or authority in the record. He's not objecting them because there's not adequate case law authority. All those things are true. But the lawyer is maintaining the client's objective, which is get me reversal. Get me out of this prison, quite literally. But the lawyer is choosing to just raise certain arguments. The question before the Supreme Court of the United States is, after the lawyer failed to achieve the objective, were the constitutional rights of the prisoner violated? Because these arguments were meritorious. They were supported by the record. There was case law precedent to support them. And the Supreme Court of the United States held, to the benefit of all of us lawyers, that the art of advocacy sometimes means that we put forth just our strongest arguments and not put forth other arguments, even though those arguments have merit. It's part art, it's part science, it's part law, it's part theater. There's a way to argue a case. And you as the lawyer, so long as you continue to honor the client's objective in the litigation, have the authority to choose the means by which that objective is achieved. And under the Froggy versus Butts case, Jones versus Barnes, the Supreme Court of the United States tells us that even in a criminal law context where very freedom is on the line, still the lawyer maintains the authority to not even raise, if the lawyer so chooses, a meritorious argument. So back to the question that is on the table, but perhaps not fully answered. What if there's a constitutional law violation and that is not frivolous and that could lead to achieve the client's objective? Are we forced, must we turn this otherwise simple case into some constitutional litigation? And the answer is no. You don't have to raise a constitutional law issue. 
so long as there's another way to achieve the client's objective. You can raise the constitutional law violation, assuming it's non-frivolous. One caveat I would give you there is something I really struggled to find some authority for. I had to go back to a book that's out of print from 1977, Professional Responsibility, where they came to the same conclusion I come to. It's a matter of opinion. Opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. Maybe my opinion's right. Maybe my opinion's wrong. I'll share it. You can take it or you can leave it. But I think if you're going to take a case that doesn't have constitutional issues in it and you're going to inject those constitutional issues into the litigation, I think you would be wise before doing so to talk about that with your client, especially if your client's not on a contingency contract, if your client is paying by the hour or in some other way where the client's bill is going to go up if you take a rather simple case and make a constitutional case out of it because constitutional issues are going to require more litigation, more hearings, more research, perhaps more depositions, perhaps an appeal. In my humble opinion, if you're going to make a mountain out of a molehill, that's probably something you should alert your client to, especially if your client's paying by the hour. What do you think of that opinion? You think that's sound advice? I had to go back to 1977 to find somebody who shared it, but I think it's sound advice. So that, my friends, is the Froggy versus Butts case. But now let's move on to some more nuts and bolts. Let's talk about those actual pleading requirements. You've decided that it's in your client's best interest and it is your best advocacy to bring that constitutional law violation. How exactly are you going to do that? And one of the things you've got to watch out for is whether there is a pre-suit requirement. And in many Florida constitutional law cases, you will find that there is one. If there is a pre-suit requirement, but you didn't exhaust the pre-suit requirement before filing suit, then your constitutional claim, your entire suit may be dismissed without you getting any relief for your client. And that's true even if your claim was meritorious. Is that counterintuitive to the non-lawyer? Something as egregious as a violation of the Constitution has occurred. Shouldn't I have the right to go right to court? answer in very many cases where there's a pre-suit requirement, such as under the Florida Civil Rights Act, which we'll discuss in more detail in just a moment, the answer is no. And to help you illustrate the importance of this, put yourself in a lawyer's shoes. Imagine that you're representing a client, a client who has suffered a violation of their constitutional rights. Your client has been wronged. So you call on the phone, you call Ben, Ben wrong. Hi, Ben, it's me, your lawyer. Yes, no, that's right, Ben. Thank you for being so appreciative and really appreciating me. Yes, I'm, I'm flattered too, Ben, to be helping with you with your suit. I know, I know Bullseye did discriminate against you when they fired you, Ben wrong. I know that, I know that. I just wanted to update you on your case. Um, there was a pre-suit requirement. I, either didn't know that or forgot it. So now your case is dismissed. And as with most dismissals, uh, taxable costs have been awarded against you in favor of bullseye. Don't forget to write that check within 14 days. Ben, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to make that phone call? No. So if there's a pre-suit requirement, step one, know about it. Step two, exhaust the pre-suit requirement. Sound like a good plan? You can do this. As I get into some nitty gritty, as I get into some details of constitutional law litigation pleadings, please, 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 please don't let this be the takeaway. Oh, it's too complex, I can't do it. No, <coughs> you can do it. You can do this. You can, I'm gonna show you how, you can. So one example of when there's a pre-suit requirement, a fundamental right under the Florida Declaration of Rights has been violated, and it becomes actionable under the Florida Civil Rights Act, which is found in Chapter 760 of the Florida Statutes. There, the pre-suit requirement involves an agency called the Florida Commission on Human Relations, the FCHR. This is the statewide equivalent. There are local equivalents also. This is the statewide equivalent of the EEOC, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Heard of them? Okay, so you haven't heard of FCHR, but you've heard of EEOC, right? 
So let me ask you this. How then am I going to exhaust that free suit requirement? How am I going to help Ben Wronged? My client's Ben Wronged, okay? Ben Wronged was fired by Bullseye, a privately owned supermarket in Orlando. Any similarities to a real supermarket or a real individual are purely coincidental. He believes he was fired because of his race. And he has these questions for you. Now I'm going to reuse these questions in different scenarios for different Floridians throughout the rest of this class. Who knows, if you were to take a final exam in this class, hint, hint, you might find, hint, hint, questions on this format, hint, hint, on the final exam, hint, hint. Did anyone miss the hint? <laughs> okay. So Ben Wrong's been fired by both sides. And as many non-lawyers might ask a lawyer like you, You've got questions such as this. A, what lawsuit, writ claim, or administrative action can you file for me? B, what is the full proper name of the specific court, tribunal, entity, or agency where we should file my case? Well, I got to know exactly where to file it. Yes, you're the lawyer. <laughs> Question C, what are the legal issues and things we need to prove in order to win my case? Or stated somewhat differently, what are the elements of the action that we are? So let's look at that first question, right? And I guess the buzzing in isn't working. But Ben Wrong was fired. He believes it's because of his race. He asks, what lawsuit, writ claim, or administrative action can you file from? The first of the wrong answers would be a petition for writ of quo warranto. Second of the wrong answers would be a petition for writ, Sir Sherard. The third of the wrong answers would be to file a complaint for violation of the Florida Civil Rights Act or a complaint for declaratory judgment, all four equally wrong. Because before we can go to court, we have to exhaust the pre-suit remedy. We've got to file with FCHR or the EEOC a charge of discrimination based on race. McGinley have overwhelmed me. McGinley, I'll never help someone whose civil rights have been violated. McGinley, I can't handle this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. What does this pleading look like? Google it. It's a form. You fill it out right there on your laptop. Do you need 17 associates, three partners, a law library as big as this room, and a powerful firm behind you? No. Go to your local coffee shop that has Wi-Fi, and you can do this. Literally, you can do this from your kitchen table. How do I dual file with the EEOC and the FCHR? There's a box that says, would you like to dual file? Check here. And if you check there, you have dual file. <laughs> then send the form to one of the two agencies you've dual filed with and they'll send it to the other. You can do this. How do I send the form? You can email it. Don't have a printer? That's not an excuse. <clears throat> you can do this. If there's anything you leave this room with, if there's any takeaway, is that you really can do something about an individual you meet on the street, in your church, in your synagogue, in your mosque, in your supermarket, in your daily interactions, who feels they've been wronged. You can do something about it. You'll need a license to practice law first. <laughs> Once you've got that, you can do something about it. One of the things I'd like you to do something about is to buzz in live so I can see you get the right answers here. And of course, we always take a break at some point during this lecture. So let's take our 10 minute break now. I'll play with the technology. Lord willing, when you come back, I'll be able to see you buzzing in with the right answers. <clears throat> Sound good? Oh, there's a question before we go. Yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't hear a question. Oh, you want to know who our lead counsel is so I can pick on them? I'll do that during the break, too. When we come back, we'll meet our lead counsel and we'll humiliate, I mean, get their assistance. Yeah, no, of course we won't. No, yeah, never. Yeah, but thank you. And on behalf of all the lead counsel who are about to be outed, they thank you, too. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, let's take that 10-minute break, shall we? I'll see you in 10. Can yes. Oh, question. Yeah. Before you can go to court, you have to file. 
that one. Charge of discrimination. Some of them that this is how you begin to exhaust those administrative records. Administrative you remedies. fill out this form. It's a form. It's online. You can okay. fill in the blanks, and that is what you do. All right, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I have more details to come. The quick answer, you'll get more details in a minute. You'll get to choose one. Your hands may be tied based on time limits. You've got 300 days to file with the EOC, 365 days with FCHR. So depending on when you're filing, you may be time barred on one and not the other. But in most cases, without a time bar, you're going to choose one. And there'll be some strategy as to which one you choose. And I'll go over that a little bit, too. So, uh, right with the, he got here first. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh, don't get signing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's been covered so now. <laughs> Did I answer? Uh, well, you responded to me, but it wasn't. I mean, it's, it's nothing that you can do because it's not. Uh, oh, is it the midterm or the fight? Mid 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 uh, no, the midterm has been difficult for me. I have Amos class and this one, so I filed the variance. Does that? The registrar sucks. Uh, well, I disagree, but I, it, it's something you got to fix. But uh, uh, I filed the variance, so I should be hearing from them tomorrow about whether I'm going to be here for your exam and whether it's in which one I'm pushing. So. I'll let you know. I'll email you when I know that. They'll, they'll fix that. Yeah. I, I don't know how that happened, but they're going to fix that. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. They're going to fix that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, where the, where, where the name? I kept your wings. Yeah, I've got the okay. knife last. Okay. No. Well, I'm just going to do it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Like, don't worry. Like not like the lectures. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I think she's just glad to have it be something. Yeah. Oh, instead of an Yeah. What? What? I missed that. He said Barry used stuff is very last minute. Oh. I'm talking about this class, not a class called Delta. I'm talking about this class. Yeah. I wasn't here when Miss Staus was talking, but Miss Staus's talk is being being described roughly as bar review-ish. Mm -hmm. And yes, what she covered is fair game. Yes. Like I mean, there's only ten questions. So I know you have to yeah. think what it's going to be. How many stuff online? Your lecture. I don't want to answer specificity to one and not all. I'm sorry to hype the fall. It'd be nice if I could just pull out the ten questions 15, and say, "Here they are," but I can't do that. Chapter fifteen is also from the lecture that we had. Is is that Fred Trable's constitutional criminal procedure? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's yeah. about Yeah. You can do this. Oh, I'm not. And hopefully, I can fix this. Yeah. I was using Oregon, I think it was just a whole 
She's got that a lot. Also, oh, here, you have to put this in the way. So, it's actually Okay, all right. Hashtag Harvard. <laughs> Oh, my God. I So, chapter 15 is game. Yes. Yes. And he was also trying to say that the borrowed stuff is game. And then we got kind of lost. Because, wait, he said 15 for sure? I'm yeah. sure it's going to be like... 1, 2, 3, 15. And then he said whatever Kaylee covered. I said, I was like, well, it's only 10 questions. I would have seen half the questions from the chapters. And he was like, well, I don't want to say anything definitively. So... I don't know. I mean, I love class class, but like not for my family. You know? <laughs> I'm trying to think like how you, you could make it. Like this. I'm like trying staring to think. Off. What, what, what question could you make from that entire thing? Well, that would be logical with my thinking. thinking it was like material used to show up. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm going to reread chapter two. I'm just going to read the rest of the chapter. Yeah. Because he said the material too. So I think it's going to be all there. Yeah. You know what I think? I think it's going to be. And the test is super hard. And the final will be like, big up. I agree. I'll lure you into a call center. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. 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 But like also, I'm on call and I read for chapter two, not chapter three. Yeah. Well, good thing on call is like nothing really. Today was. No, I checked it really well with it. And now they're just super stylish. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, <laughs> 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 
Oh, really? On the website? Oh, no, I want that. Okay, I'll fix that. Okay, yeah. The goal was you click it and then another window opens up and you can download it. That's not happening. I'm sorry. I'll fix that. Okay. So you can, you can, I'm going to put these slides either tonight or in the morning at the same time. Okay, so 24 hours from now, I don't know if the slides go through. That would be fixed. Yeah. Uh, can, can someone help me test the tech? Anybody want to be a, a tester? Oh. You got it up? Okay. You got it up? Still not live. No. It just says wait. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Hope you hope you had a productive break. Maybe got a latte, Red Bull, espresso, something that'll keep you awake through one of my lectures. Hope you managed to find that. Yeah. But anyway, welcome back. Uh, I want to thank the folks in the front row who helped me test the technology. I want to apologize for the fact that I guess it's just not going to play along with us today. So, so that's all right. We'll do it old school. We'll just talk to one another. <laughs> well, I know we're supposed to, yeah, we're supposed to just stare at our screens and communicate with uh, likes and things like that. But, but let's do it. Let's try it. Let's just talk. Sound good? And to help us talk, I know. Yes. So yes, a question. That's part of talking. I like it. Yeah. yeah. In the defending of your colleagues, do you find uh, the adage that lawyers are the worst witnesses to the truth? You know, that's that's an easy way out, isn't it? It seems like. Fact is, I shouldn't have put my own client on the stand. Now, in my defense, there's no like uh, Fifth Amendment privilege in a bar grievance proceeding. The bar could easily have called them, and maybe they would have. Surprisingly, they had no cross examination after after his so. testimony. Yeah, yeah, they didn't feel the need. But no, I I shouldn't have put him on the stand. So. Now here, here's the teachable moment. He was urging me to put him on the stand. Does that mean I had to? No, no, no. Can you stop? Yeah. It, you know, he called an audible. But I'm a coach. <laughs> I designed the plays. Players, I listen to the coach. Maybe. Yeah. But does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an easy out to say, you know, lawyers make the worst witnesses or something. That's not always true. Yeah. We'll find out. Yeah. To, to the judge's credit, she's. She is not yet ruled, so yeah, emotions will certainly be cool, cooled off when, when the decision is made. Yeah. All right, but I know we've got a few who say, "Here I am, it is I." 
They are. Our lead counsels. So let's meet our lead counsel today. <laughs> Who is on the lead counsel list? Drum roll, please. I was just hoping somebody would call themselves a lead counsel. <laughs> We're week six. Really? Yeah. Does that does that help you uh, at all? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just call on everyone around. That is the old-fashioned law school way, is it not? All right. So let's go back to our client and friend, Ben Wronged. I, I thought it was witty. Thank you. Yeah, Ben Wronged. So the first question Ben wanted to know is what lawsuit, writ claim, or administrative action can you file for me? Was it a lawsuit? No. No, we have a pre-suit requirement. It certainly wasn't an extraordinary writ. We will play everyone's favorite game show, name that writ before the semester is over, and we will study in great detail. Writs of certiorari, writs of quo warranto, writs of mandamus. We've already seen writ habeas corpus. Remember that one? Great writ. I guess it might be called a claim, but it's certainly administrative action. Because where it is filed is with an administrative agency. The answer is you're going to file an agency complaint. The name of that complaint is a charge of discrimination. Da -da 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 -da, charge <laughs> of discrimination. Someone laughs at my joke. Thank you. So as I told you before, if you're waiting for the funny joke, it's not coming. Just go ahead and laugh at these. All right. You can do it on the required forms. You can open a blank word processor and a statute and try to go like, no, I'm just going to fill in the blanks. Okay. Fill in the form. Next question Ben wants to know, what's the full proper name of the specific court, tribunal, entity, or agency where we should file my case, where we should file the charge of discrimination? Who's going to answer that for me before calling someone? I like that. It's amazing how many people can look down and away all at once. But, <laughs> sir, you raised your hand. Tell us, please. Yes. You've answered correctly. The answer was EEOC, which is the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. There you go. The other choice is the FCHR, which is the State of Florida Commission on Human Relations. Depending on where you are, perhaps you're in Miami-Dade County, perhaps you're somewhere else, where there is a local agency created under local government to which the tasks of FCHR have been delegated. So you might start there. So the answer is FCHR, or it could be dual filed with the EEOC. Remember that highly technical way that we get the form to be dual filed? Do you remember? Yeah, check the box. Yes, for dual file. Yeah. And then each agency will open a file. Does that mean each agency will work diligently on the file? Probably not. There's a work sharing agreement between EEOC and FCHR. And under that work sharing agreement, one of them will take the lead. Just a polite way of saying the other one ain't going to do squat. But it is dual file. Why file with one and not the other? There may be different reasons. For example, we'll talk about some defenses in a moment. You'll see that the statute of limitations is particularly short, but shorter in one versus the other. So you might find that you're time barred in one agency, but not in the other. Also, practitioners tend to compare the results they get. Practitioners come to certain conclusions, rightfully or wrongfully, that a particular agency is more favorable to this type of claim or the other agency is less favorable to that type of claim. Also, the agencies might offer certain forms of help. For example, you might have great admiration for one of the on-staff mediators that works for FCHR. And you might think, oh, I know that mediator and I know my client. The two of them would get along very well. This mediator would work hard for my client. So there are strategic decisions to be made there. The next question Ben Rond might ask you, what are the legal issues and things we need to prove in my case? Or stated somewhat differently, what are the elements of an action for claim of discrimination? And that very long winded answer can be in the most brief way summarized as follows. Okay. First, the claimant the aggrieved, the future plaintiff, must prove a prima facie case. Anybody speak Latin? Prima facie case, and may do so by either direct or indirect, which you might call circumstantial evidence. If 
degree does this, then temporarily, this is unusual for cause of action, temporarily the burden of proof shifts from the plaintiff to the defense. And what is the defense's burden of proof? They must prove a legitimate non-discriminatory reason, or at least show one. There's a little fly <laughs> buzzing around my head. If they do, then the burden of proof comes back to where it usually resides upon a plaintiff, upon a plaintiff. If they do, then the plaintiff must prove that the specific reason proffered by the defense is pretextual. It's a pretext. It's not true. It's BS. It's a fabrication. So how does this work in well, let's make up a hypothetical, shall we? We've been dealing with Ben Wrong, who hypothetically works at Bullseye Supermarket in Orlando. So hypothetically, Ben Wrong has a supervisor, who hypothetically has a boss. Maybe that's the general manager. And the general manager is overheard talking to Ben's supervisor. You will fire Ben Wrong, says the general manager. Why, says Ben's supervisor. His race, says the general manager. Fire Ben wrong because of his race. These are the facts and evidence. How does this become a charge of discrimination? How does this become either successful or unsuccessful litigation? Well, let's look at step one. First, we've got to prove a prima facie case. We've got to prove that Ben wasn't fired for another reason. He was fired based on a discriminatory motive that the act of firing Ben violated Ben's constitutional rights, his civil rights to not be discriminated against because of his race. So we come forward with the allegation that we can prove because it was overheard that Ben's supervisor was told by the general manager to fire Ben because of his race. Now, what kind of evidence would that be? That would be the rare case. That would be a case of direct evidence. Those are rare. Those are rare. Most of the cases you will bring, if you bring this kind of law, will not be cases of direct evidence. Even the case law will tell you that that's a rare case. And that should make sense if you've ever dealt with a bigot. <laughs> ever met a bigot? Typically, the bigot doesn't walk up and say, hi, I'm a bigot. <laughs> I go around discriminating against people. Typically, the bigot doesn't do that. Either because the bigot honestly believes it or the bigot is trying to hide it, the bigot's going to come up with some sort of rationale, some sort of reason by why the bigot does that. And skipping over for a moment, the indirect evidence, the usual case, let me stick with this highly unusual direct evidence case, which we've now satisfied step one. Because of that, temporarily, the burden of proof has shifted to the defense to do what? To show a legitimate, non-discriminatory reason. How on earth would you do that, the defense do that, in a case such as this hypothetical, where the general manager was overheard saying, fire Ben wrong, it's his race, it's because of his race. Well, here comes the affidavit of the general manager who describes his lifelong love of watching marathons, 5Ks, and foot races. Who happened to be at one of these marathons, 5Ks, and foot races where Ben Wrong was running in the race. And Ben happened to be wearing a bullseye t-shirt. And this lover of foot races perceived Ben as not giving it his all. Didn't give this race 100%. Felt that was an embarrassment to his supermarket. And when he told the supervisor it's his race, fire him because of his race, he was referring to that 5K that he had been running. Now, in my hypothetical, what is this? It's a bald-faced lie, is it not? It's a fabrication. It's a bunch of bunk, and it is sufficient to meet the defense's burden to show a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. Because at this stage of the proceeding, they merely have to come forward 
with a colorable excuse, a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. If it were true, would it be a legitimate non-discriminatory reason? That's the standard at this point in the litigation. And that affidavit is preposterous. It is laughable. It is a lie and it is sufficient to overcome step two and shift the burden back to the plaintiff in this rarest of things, this in, I'm sorry, this rarest of things, this direct evidence case. So that brings the burden of proof back to where it usually pres resides upon the claimant, upon the plaintiff. Their burden is to prove that the reason is pretextual. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why you go to law school. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why you go to moot court. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why you do activities in your legal research and writing class. This is why you learn how to cross-examine. Because this is where the case turns based on your skills. This is where you need to be able to cross-examine the defense and prove that it's nothing but a pretext. It's nothing but an excuse. It's nothing but a lie. It's nothing but bunk. And in my hypothetical with this silly race thing, that can be easy. But in the real world, it's not always that easy. In the real world, people get set up. People get disciplined for being a minute late or for not stocking a shelf perfectly when in fact they weren't a minute late and the shelf was adequate. Bigots try to create a paper trail. They try to prove that there was an undiscriminatory reason. They plan before they act. So this is where good lawyering comes in. Not just cross-examination, but discovery. You've studied discovery where you talk to other witnesses, where you learn about other events. For example, in the typical case, we don't have direct evidence. Typically, we have a case of indirect evidence. What is indirect evidence? It is circumstantial evidence. What is circumstantial evidence? It is statistics, for example. Hypothetically speaking, let's say Bullseye happened to employ 90% of its employees lived within 10 miles of the store. Hypothetically, within 10 miles of the store, the population was 80% of a certain race. Hypothetically, Bullseye's employees was less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of that race. Is that direct proof of discrimination in their hiring? It's not direct proof, but it is indirect proof. It is circumstantial evidence. You're going to need to build your case. One of the advantages to the pre-suit requirement is that if the agency is doing its work right, it is looking at statistics such as these. It is potentially building a case as it investigates the claim that you put before it by filling out that form. But if ultimately you have that right to sue letter, and ultimately it becomes your case that you're litigating, not the agency's case that they're litigating, you're going to need to do discovery. You're going to need to do document requests. You're going to need to compile statistics. You're going to need to talk to witnesses. You're going to have to find out why others were fired. You're going to have to hear other supervisors describe the work that they did and why they did it, who they were told to hire, who they were told to fire. You're going to have to work hard because the bigots don't walk up to you and say, hi, I'm a bigot. I discriminate against my employees. Any questions for me? <laughs> they don't do that. Hard work. Sometimes there's no substitute for it. And that can certainly be true in a civil rights case. So what questions do we have? Do we understand the difference between direct and indirect evidence? Do we understand the, understand the low bar that the defense must overcome when it comes to a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. Do we understand how to overcome something and what we need to do to prove a pretext? Any questions about how to help Ben wrong? Well, then let me ask a question to you. Would you help Ben wrong? <coughs> Would you help Ben wrong? I don't know where you met Ben. Friend of a friend walking down the street. 
would you help Venmo? You can. You could. Sure, it's nice to be a specialist. It's nice to be an expert in things. I'm not saying that the specialists and the experts don't have an advantage. They do. But if you meet someone and they, this flight keeps landing my nose. <laughs> you meet someone and they are the victim of a civil rights violation. I hope you'll have the confidence to help them if they can't get help elsewhere or if for whatever reason you're the right person to help. This can be done. You can do this. Let me look at some timelines under the Florida Civil Rights Act. What deadlines does Van Wong face? The first thing that Van faces is a very short statute of limitations. Specifically, when it comes to filing with the FCHR, you've got 365 days. You don't have a year. That's important because one out of every four years has more than 365 days in it. Okay? You don't have a year. You have 365 days. I'm sorry, that's the FCHR. The EOC had 300 days, considerably shorter than a year. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you might be time barred from one, but not the other. A second deadline I want to talk to you about. If the FCHR's notice of determination finds no reasonable cause, then you haven't exhausted your administrative remedies yet. When you're holding in your hand the agency's right to sue letter, when the agency has given you a right to sue, God bless you, then you've exhausted the administrative remedies. But that might not be the outcome. The agency, after investigating, might find no reasonable cause. So your work with the agency is not done yet. You've got to file a request for an agency hearing. And you've got just 35 days to do that. Like, Gilly, what are you telling me? My client suffered a violation of his or her civil rights, and I happen to file on day 36, and that civil rights goes unremedied? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Another deadline. The agency might issue that right to sue letter. If they do, then you've got one year one year if it's an FCHR right to sue letter or 90 days if it was either issued by the EOC or you checked off that box for dual file. So when it comes to that strategy decision, you can factor that in as to where you file and whether you check off the dual file box. The fly landed on you just then. The fly loves this bone. And one overall deadline, this is not a replacement for any of these other deadlines, but this particular statute of limitations deadline, this clock is ticking in the background, ticking, 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 while you're trying to get all the other work done. And that is you've got four years from the last discriminatory act, the last discriminatory harm that your client suffered, you've got an overall four year statute of limitations. So what if that last act, that last discrimination was three years, 11 months, and five days ago. Well, remember, you've got to exhaust your administrative remedies, and some of these are going to take some time. You may not have enough time to meet the four-year statute of limitations. So you've met Ben Wrong, you've decided to help him or her. Don't diary four years from now. Diary 300 days. Not 300 days from now. 300 days from the last act of discrimination that Ben Wrong suffered. And in addition to that deadline, diary the four-year statute of limitations and keep track of both. Does this mean, McGinley, I can't handle this? McGinley, I'm not going to take these kinds of cases? No, because you know what? We've all got a calendar in our pockets, do we not? No matter what phone you're using, it's got a built-in calendar app. You can calendar. You can do this. You can meet these deadlines. Defenses under the Florida Civil Rights Act. Not going to cover them all. Not going to cover them all in detail, just to give you a taste. So one of them, some defenses Ben Wrong might face. A missed deadline that we just talked about, that becomes a defense called the failure to exhaust administrative remedies. That's how the defense will argue later when you file suit because you missed a deadline. Now, the civil suit allegations are limited to the agency charge. What does that mean? Okay. 
say you filed a claim and you've alleged that Ben Ron was fired because of his race. You got your right to sue letter, you're doing your discovery, you find out the truth. Ben was discriminated against, Ben's civil rights were violated, but it wasn't because of Ben's race, it's because of Ben's age. Ben was discriminated in an age discrimination claim. You have not exhausted your administrative remedies as to his age discrimination claim. Your charges in the civil suit are limited to the alleged discrimination that you alleged in the administrative claim. So what do I do to fix that? If there's time, because remember that short 300 or 365 day time limitation, if there's time, you pull out another charge of discrimination, you file another one with EEOC or FCHR and you exhaust the administrative remedies. But perhaps you found out too late. Perhaps the bigot did what the bigots often do and covered their tracks. This is where good lawyering becomes essential. Another deadline, the employer may be too small. What if Bullseye has 12 employees and not more? Does that mean they can violate the Florida Civil Rights Act with impunity and you can't hold them responsible? Yes, it does. Hypothetically speaking, there could be employers out there who simply don't grow big enough that you can hold them liable. This could be a legitimate concern in what many call today the gig economy, where nobody's really an employee of anybody anymore. We're all 1099s. We're all independent contractors. How do we protect our civil rights when we don't even have the protections of an employee? These are some of the issues we're going to have to address as a society. Another deadline, something called back pay is discretionary and it's subject to offset for failure to mitigate damages. This may be handy. Good time to use a marker perhaps. Okay, so Ben is hired. This will be a timeline, okay? This is a line from yesterday to today to tomorrow, okay? Ben's hired, then Ben's fired, okay? Maybe he's hired on January 1st, 2001, fired on November 1st, 2001, okay? Then Ben's going to go to trial. That trial's going to start when? November 2nd, 2001? November 3rd, 2001? Right? You got 300 days, 365 days. The agency's going to investigate. You got to file a hearing with them, you got to file suit, you have to do discovery, the other side has to do discovery, judge has got to be available, opposing counsel's got to be available. Trial's not going to be on November 1st, 2001. It's not going to be on November 2nd, 2001. Maybe it's going to be on January 3rd, 2004, right? During this time, from November 1st, 2001 to January 3rd, 2004, hypothetical dates, but during the time from when Ben suffers the harm and Ben gets to talk to the jury, Ben's out of work. Wrongfully so, he was wrongfully fired. We're gonna to refer to that as back pay. Back pay is discretionary and it's subject to an offset for failure to mitigate damages. So Ben is deposed by the defense. Ben, I understand you were fired. Yes, yes, I was. Okay. You were fired on November 1st, 2001. Ben, is that right? Yes, 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 I was. How many job applications did you fill out on January 2nd, Ben, 2001? How many on the 3rd? How many on the 4th? How many that month? How many in the subsequent two months? Well, you know, it hit me hard. Wasn't sure what to do. It was emotional. It was emotional. It's the name of the psychiatrist, psychologist you saw. Objection. We don't have a psych claim. 
the defense is entitled to argue that Ben needs to mitigate his damages. Even if Ben is alleging that he's wrongfully out of work, Ben has an obligation to look for work. And you're going to have a jury of Ben's peers deciding whether Ben's job search was adequate or not. Just as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, adequacy is in the eye of the beholder. Perhaps you've got a juror who him or herself is out of work and they know how hard it is to find a job. Perhaps you have the opposite juror who's never been out of work and doesn't understand why anybody ever would be. Just pick up the phone, talk to your friend, and go to work at the next employer the next day, he says that juror. So back pay is discretionary, and it's subject to an offset for failure to mitigate damages. Understand the problem there? Punitive damages are capped under 760.11 sub 5 at $100,000 per person. How's that work? You went to trial. January 3rd, 2004. The jury came back. They're offended. They award Ben wronged his economic damages, that being his wage loss. But they also heard your argument and took it to heart that there must be punitive damages so that employers similarly situated to them, these discriminatory employers, are dissuaded from doing so. So in addition to the economic damages, congratulations. They've also awarded punitive damages of $8 million. $8 million. Ben is thrilled. You are thrilled. Your wife is there. She's already planning to buy some stuff. <laughs> You're working on a contingency. That's 40%. 40% of $8 million. That's lots, right? <laughs> so you come back to trial the next day. The jury's been dismissed. They've already been polled. They've already got the verdict. All that's left is for the judge to sign a judgment. With that beautiful language at the bottom, for which some let execution issue. <laughs> and you've got it matched up with the verdict there. It says $8 million. And the judge has got the pen. Yes, I'm going to sign. Oh, but there's one thing i got to change first, says the judge. i got to cross out the $8 million and write in $100,000. Because punitive damages are capped under the statute. <sighs> Shouldn't have spent your three and a half million overnight like that. Because <laughs> that sum ain't for which execution will issue. You're not getting that. Oh. Unlike Title VII, the FCRA, Title VII, really with federal law, federal civil rights act, okay? Unlike Title VII, the FCRA permits individual liability in two discrete situations. So here, under the Florida Civil Rights Act, I can hold someone personally liable in two discrete situations where they couldn't be held personally liable under the Federal Civil Rights Act. So a little more protection. That laboratory of democracy, enforcing the full panoply of federal civil rights, but yet granting even greater rights to Floridians under the Florida Constitution. Here's an example of it, because there's two discrete situations where the FCRA will permit individual liability, but the Federal Civil Rights Act did not. The first is discrimination by individuals against those seeking occupational business licenses. Anybody here plan on taking a bar exam and getting an occupational business license someday? I already have my business. Yeah, yeah. What if the Florida Board of Bar Examiners or some other Board of Bar Examiners discriminates against you. You could sue the entity. You could also sue the individuals who discriminate against you. Hope you're not discriminated against, but if God forbid you are, that's nice to know. Second discrete situation, discrimination by individuals operating public lodging or public food service establishments. You're going to a hotel, motel, Holiday Inn. <laughs> How's it going? Thank you. <laughs> or you're getting a bite to eat at the restaurant. <laughs> I guess I guess I'm not the hip hop rapper I'd like to be. <laughs> or you're in a restaurant and you're discriminated against. This could lead to personal liability. You could sue the innkeeper personally. You could sue the waiter, waitress, server. Personally. So there you go. 
attorney fees under the Florida Civil Rights Act. And if I haven't convinced you yet that you can do this, you can represent Ben Wronged. If you come across Ben Wronged, maybe this will seal the deal. Florida Statute 760.11 is interpreted consistently with the Federal Civil Rights Act 28 U.S.C. Section 1988 and provides attorney fees if the plaintiff prevails. It's not truly a one-way street insofar as the defense can, maybe, probably not collect attorney fees, whereas you can probably collect attorney fees as the plaintiff, because it works this way. If the plaintiff prevails, then just about always, with that comes an additional award of attorney fees. So when the judge signed the judgment and crossed out $8 million on the premium of damages and wrote in $100,000, the judge also wrote in plus reasonable attorney fees. And you get to come back to court with your best attorney friends in tow who all testify how efficiently and reasonably you worked those 10 million seven hundred hours and clearly should be entitled to three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour. And that money isn't money Ben wronged needs to pay to you. That becomes a separate judgment for which some let execution issue issued against the losing defendant. And those are attorney fees. Those are addition to taxable costs. What if the defendant won? What if Ben lost? Well, Ben's going to owe the taxable costs. But Ben is not, not going to owe attorney fees to the prevailing defendant unless the defendant comes forward and meets the defendant's burden to prove that the plaintiff's claim was frivolous. So all, almost all, the plaintiff had to do was prevail, but the defense had to do more, had to prevail and then meet a burden to prove that the claim was frivolous. I love this loaded sentence. Check this out. Taxable costs are awarded to the prevailing party if there is one. What, 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 what? <laughs> After all this litigation, didn't somebody win? Well, under the case law, maybe not. Maybe not. The case law regarding taxable costs has a separate inquiry as to whether either side was the prevailing party. You can win and not be the prevailing party. Let me explain how. Say you're suing on behalf of Ben Wrong, suing for $400,000 in back pay and 100,000 in punitive damages, and the jury comes back, they find Ben was discriminated, and they award him no punitive damages and $1 in back pay. Did Ben win? Yeah. Was Ben a prevailing party? Probably not under the case law which provides the detailed analysis as to whether or not there was a prevailing party. And for the purposes of our class, that's as detailed as you need to know about that. Just know that that's a potential issue and know that that's a standard you'll need to inquire as to whether any side was the prevailing party. So with that, we move on to part C of our text, which talks about standing. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ben might be able to prove and certainly is entitled to plead that he's entitled to emotional distress. And that can come in two forms. That could be his bad feelings, or it could be in a particular case that he's actually under medical care. There may be physicians involved, whether they're psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists or one or both or all three. So there can be economic damages that come out of that particular emotional distress claim. Or there can just be non-economic damages that come out of the emotional distress claim. Perhaps he's not under any sort of medical care or therapy, but yet the jury is convinced that there was emotional scars, there was emotional baggage, there was emotional harm, and therefore there should be a financial award for the emotional pain. So that is available to be pled and proven. 
Punitive damages are another one that works similarly. You're going to need permission to amend your complaint to add a claim of punitive damages after you have sufficient proof through discovery, but that can be added there. Another type of damages might be whatever economic harm you can relate back to the particular type of discrimination. Sometimes the discrimination is at the workplace, sometimes it might be in a, a lodging establishment, it might be at a, a restaurant. The type of economic damage might vary, but you'll need to meet your burden of proof and then plead and prove those particular economic damages. So yeah, there are the types of damages that are available. You'll want to interview well your client and be able to determine and then document and then prove those damages. So I've had clients and they're bringing, I know that they're going to be bringing this particular type of claim. They're still employed, they're suffering the discrimination but they're hanging in there and I'm urging them and they're indeed keeping a diary and they're writing down contemporaneously what they're feeling, what they're going through. And if I'm successful in getting that into evidence, then hopefully I can bring the jury to a place contemporaneously where they can feel what my client was feeling at that time. So part of establishing damages is to help your client document and prove those damages. That might involve working with the physicians. What I find with physicians is they're very keen and very educated on hearing the symptoms and determining the diagnosis, providing the treatment. Hear the symptoms, determine the diagnosis, provide the treatment. Hear the symptoms, determine the diagnosis, provide the treatment. And rarely do they stop and say, why? Why the symptoms? Why the diagnosis? Other physicians are good about asking themselves mm -hmm. that. You can work with the physicians and try to document in the medical records, not only the what, but the why. So that can go a long way too. I hope that answers the question. Yes. Okay. Any other questions before I get to standing, which all of you are sitting, I'm doing this stand. <laughs> told you it's the best I got for you. That's good. All right. There you go. All right, standing. Let's talk about standing. Let's talk about Alachua County versus Sharps. Anybody read that case and just dying to talk to me about it? Man, I don't understand. Just because it's midterms week and everybody's got an exam in all of their classes in like 48 hours, you didn't stop to read Alachua County versus Sharps? What if I just made up the facts? Could you even stop me from doing that? No, you can't. Here's the facts I'll make up. Okay, in Alachua County versus Sharps, there's a local government, okay? And these locally elected politicians, they're very globally minded. They're gonna spend some local dollars in Alachua County, and they're gonna put out a ballot. Cost some money to put out a ballot. And they're gonna ask everybody in Alachua County this question. Do you favor legislation to create a system of universal health care in Florida? Okay, can the Board of County Commissioners of Alachua County create a universal health care system in the state of Florida? Well, without even having studied municipal law, I bet you'll get the answer right. No, they cannot, right? But here they are spending those taxpayer dollars to hold this referendum, to ask this question. And at least one of these taxpayers, a sharp fellow by the name of Sharps, says, oh, I don't want my tax dollars wasted in that way. And he files suit. But the question becomes, does Sharps have standing? Does he have standing? What's standing? What are we talking about in pleadings when we talk about standing? Standing is the right to be the party that brings that suit. Standing is the right to be the party that brings that suit. You heard about a wrong. Can you be the one to bring suit to right that wrong? Only if you have standing. You've got to have standing. So they're wasting Alachua County taxpayer dollars. Mr. Sharps is a taxpayer in Alachua County. Does Mr. Sharps have standing? 
the answer as held by the district court of appeal in this case is no. And it gives us a very thorough description on pages 93 through 95 of what it takes to have taxpayer standing. Taxpayer standing, it says, is available if the taxpayer can show that a government taxing measure or expenditure violates specific constitutional limitations on the taxing and spending power. That's broadly stated. That makes it sound like anybody who pays taxes can bring a claim if they can relate it back to expenditure. And that is not, that is not the standard for taxpayer standing. That is not. Ultimately, you can come up with standing if it was based on you paid the dollars for anything and everything. And we're not, not going to obliterate the requirement of standing by adopting such a standard. Instead, a taxpayer can only have standing upon a showing of special injury, which is distinct from that suffered by other taxpayers in the taxing district. So can I sue anytime there's a wrong and I can track that wrong back to some money spent by a government? The answer is no. The answer is no. So merely being a taxpayer is not going to give you standing to object to what a government wants to do. Also addressed here is First Amendment standing. Also addressed here is equal protection standing. And I would urge you, I understand the midterms are here. You haven't had time to look at this case. But I would urge you to take a look at the standards, for those two types of standing. Because you might find yourself standing in front of an exam someday that has those questions on it. That's a good standing joke, right? <laughs> So let's look at note one. It says to look at note two, but I don't have a note two. I'm on page 97. Note two must be terrible. I must have edited it out. Okay. <laughs> note one. In Alachua County versus Sharps, the court notes that the rules regarding standing are relaxed in cases of statute and rules that on their face allegedly violate a fundamental right of free speech and expression. The concern is that the legislation may have a chilling effect of preventing speech before spoken. And those who have not yet spoken might be hard pressed to argue that their speech was impeded. First Amendment standing, specifically when it comes to freedom of speech, would carve out an exception of standing. We don't require that the individual have spoken and then have been punished for what the individual said. Nor do we require that the individual attempted to speak and was thwarted from making that statement. Because we recognize that a government statute, law, rule, or action might have what the case law refers to as a chilling effect, might discourage individuals from speaking in the first place. If the individual can meet the burden of showing that the government act or action had this chilling effect, that will satisfy First Amendment freedom of speech standing. And that's where I was going with note one. But of course, you're going to read in greater detail First Amendment standing, even protection standing. So you'll get in further detail on that. I also would encourage you to consider reading Fraternal Order of Police, Miami Lodge Number 20 versus City of Miami. It's a rather recent 2017 case. It begins on page 97. And it raises this interesting question we all see in the news where the case is being brought by an entity that's not an individual. As I noted here on page 97 in the intro of, to Fraternal Order of Police versus Miami, I wrote, Surely we have all seen news reports of groups such as the Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, the Thomas More Law Center, or other groups 
bringing lawsuits challenging the constitutionality of a law, regulation, or government action. What gives them standing? What gives them standing? Yes. They find someone to represent. They find someone with specific enough facts that they can then allege and take over the case for them on their behalf. Oh, that's one way. Yeah, they could substitute a party who's an individual who has standing. Certainly, certainly that's one way. But I would encourage all of you to take a look at Fraternal Order of Police. Oh, I got some more hands up. Yes. I like that. I think that's a fair summary of the holding Fraternal Order of Police for sitting here. I like that. Is that what you were going to add to? No. Oh, you got more to add. Tell us. Well, I, I, I hear you, but perhaps that statement begs the question, why? Why do they have organizational standing, representational standing? That's what I can, I would urge you to take a look at. Let's take a look at Part D. We're going to join indispensable parties. This is page 104. I love that Florida Department of Education versus Glasser case there, 622 Southern 2nd, 944, that begins on page 104, wraps up rather quickly on page 105. Do you see what they did there? They didn't join an indispensable party, and they showed why that's a requirement in the law. Check out what happened. School board filed its action for declaratory judgment against the tax collector, didn't name the Department of Education. The board and the tax collector stipulated to an expedited hearing to be held the next day. So they got sued yesterday and stipulated to start trial today. And nobody bothered to tell the Board of Education during that 24-hour period. It was a setup. It was a sham, wasn't it? They knew what outcome they wanted. They wanted a particular outcome to that suit, but most of all, they wanted to make sure the Board of Education couldn't do anything about it. That doesn't work because they failed to join an indispensable party. Any fellow Star Wars fans in the room? Got to have your Kylo Ren. Got to have your villain to have a good story. And you got to have your villain if you're going to have a valid judgment. Courts are not in the business of giving advisory opinions. Courts are not academic institutions that answer hypothetical questions. Courts are there to decide genuine cases and controversies which affect the rights, liabilities, and responsibilities of the parties that are before them. You can't do what Florida Department of Education versus Glasser was attempting to do. You can't have a sham. You've got to add the indispensable party. You've got to add the villain. Luke Skywalker went to Endor so that he could be captured and taken to the Death Star. Ray got in that little thing and shot herself over to Kylo Ren so that he could lob Snoke in half. <laughs> the two of them could duke it out. It takes some bravery to actually confront the villain. But a lawsuit requires nothing less. And you can do nothing less if you're going to be the hero of the litigation story. Got to join the indispensable parties. Part E. Give notice to Florida's attorney general who may intervene. What if I ain't got a villain? Every good story needs a villain. Every drama needs an adversary. Here in Florida, under the Constitution of the state of Florida, we always have a villain. Her name, last two have been female, so I'll say her. Her name is Florida's attorney general. She's a part of the executive branch. She's a part of the cabinet, but she is not a political employee, uh, appointee. She is independently elected by the people of the state of Florida. 
and she has many responsibilities under Florida's Constitution, one of which is to defend every statute and administrative code rule against the argument that it is unconstitutional. What side must Florida's Attorney General be on? The side of defending the government. That is the Attorney General's constitutional obligation. That's why the rules say that Florida's Attorney General may, not must, may intervene. Must Florida's Attorney General intervene? No. But you must give Florida's Attorney General the opportunity to intervene. This is in any and every action where you're challenging the constitutionality of a statute, administrative code, rule, or government action. It's incumbent upon you, and I've got the form reprinted in the book to help you comply with Florida Statute Section 86.091. The underside hereby gives notice of compliance with Florida Rules of Procedure 1.071 with respect to the constitutional challenge brought pursuant to. You just fill in the blanks. Serve that upon the Attorney General. File a copy with the court. I've been at oral argument where the appellate court's asking opposing counsel. I don't see this in the file. You don't see what? <laughs> they don't know what the appellate court's talking about. But they'll find out when their case doesn't get resolved until they do this. Will the attorney general come and be Kylo Ren? Will the attorney general be Darth Vader? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But you've got to give the Attorney General notice. Yeah. So that's where I'm coming from. Part F. Choose among remedies. Damages. Declaratory judgment. Extraordinary writ. Injunction. You can file a complaint for damages. What's that? That's the money. How about declaratory judgment or an injunction? That's an order that grants affirmative relief that tells the government it must do or cannot do something, but it's not money. Can ask for both? Yes, you can. You can plead in the alternative. You might even ask for an extraordinary writ. And as I promised you, play America's favorite game show named that writ when we study those in greater detail. What's the difference between a complaint for damages and an action for declaratory judgment? Was McGinley wrong? Can a court actually be like academia? Can they just address hypothetical questions? No, they can't. You can't ask for declaratory judgment, but there are strict requirements that have to be met. Let's take a look at them. First, there's got to be a bona fide, actual, present, practical need for the declaration, for the court to determine the rights, responsibilities, actions, and inactions that are appropriate for the parties. Second, in addition, the declaration has to deal with the present ascertained or ascertainable state of facts or a present controversy as to those state of facts. And in addition, some power, immunity, privilege, or right of the complaining party. It's got to depend upon the facts or the law applicable to those facts. And in addition, someone or entity has or reasonably may have an actual, present, adverse, and antagonistic interest in the subject matter. And in addition, the antagonistic and adverse interests are all before the court by proper process or class presentation. Got all the indispensable parties. And in addition, the relief sought is not merely the giving of legal advice by the courts or an answer to questions propounded from curiosity. With all these requirements in place, it's not an advisory opinion after all. And if you can meet all those requirements, you can get a court to tell you what your rights are under a contract, what your rights are under a particular statute, whether your rights have been violated by the government interpreting the statute in that way. You can do this through a declaratory action. If the statute, charter, ordinance, or franchise is alleged to be unconstitutional, Florida's attorney general must be served with a copy of the complaint and be given the opportunity to be heard. This remains true in a deck action. 
Part G, fee-shifting statutes and awards of attorney fees. Here's a loaded question to leave on your minds as you pack up these books and prepare to take all those midterms. Sure, you want to think about your other classes. You want to think about other topics. But I will leave you with such a loaded question that you'll be distracted through every exam thinking, what will McGinley tell me is the answer? What will be the answer? And the question I leave you with, deliberately unanswered until next time, is this. Perhaps nothing in the law is more cherished nor more protected than our constitutional rights. So does that mean that the victim whose constitutional rights were violated is entitled to free legal services? What about a victim who can't afford a lawyer? We know that those who are criminally accused gets a public defender, right? No charge for the public defender, right? So doesn't a constitutional law victim get the equivalent of a public defender too? Intriguing. <laughs> and to be answered next time. Until that time, Bernadette and I are going to be praying individually for each and every one of you. Exams aren't fun. Exams aren't easy. But you can pass them, and we'll be praying that you do. And until that time, may God bless every one of you. I'll see you next week. No, I'll see you Monday at 6 p.m. in this very room for our midterm exam. Sound good? All right. I'll see you then. Stream. Sure, you want to end the stream. Okay. <laughs>